Merrill Memo with Matthew Dickerson from Dubbo Regional Council. Mayor of Dubbo Regional Council, Matthew Dickerson, good morning. Good morning, Rod. How are you going this morning? I'm going very well. Let's start with the most exciting news uh, out of uh, the Dubbo area, and uh, it's an event that you uh, know very well, the Toyota Tour de OROC. We had the official launch of that last week, and I was lucky enough to go along there and welcome people to Dubbo to the launch, but also talk a little bit about the Toyota Tour de OROC as the founder of that back in 2013. It's exciting though, it's building up, we've got good rider numbers, I think we'll have record rider numbers this year, we're looking for more sponsors of course, and also a bit more room for sponsors potentially there as well, but the big thing, the big news for this year Rod, is the concept has been changed ever so slightly. In the past the concept was ride as hard as you can for as long as you can all day, maybe not as hard as you can all day, but ride for a long time all day, some days were 220 kilometre long days, there were some pretty big days in there. And you'd get to each of the locations along the way and you'd basically have a shower, have something to eat and go to bed because you're pretty exhausted after riding at a couple hundred kilometres for the day. This year the concept's been changed where the distances are back to be a bit more reasonable, uh, maybe 100, say up to 160 kilometres in a day, so about half the distances is normal. And then when we get to each location, there's time to be a tourist in that location. And it was on the back of some people that have travelled from a long way away to be part of the previous Toyota Tour de Rocks. They said, well, I looked at each of those towns, but I didn't really see them because we rode through, we slept in a motel or slept in, in someone's place and then got up and did it all again the next day. So I think this would be a bit different. Normally we'd cover about 1,200 kilometres in the week. This year we're going to cover 740 kilometres in the week. So it's a bit different. And again, a bit of a chance to experience each of those outback locations and some iconic locations, including Burke along the way. Yep, sounds like a very good move and uh, hopefully the numbers uh, will be there and you get the uh, sponsorship and uh, there's also the opportunity for uh, partners like myself uh, to buy a ticket and a raffle and win a Toyota rap all. Yeah, exactly right. That's something else we've tried different this year. You always want to make sure that something that's successful, you keep doing the same formula but you, you don't want to let it get stale and so you're trying different things and that's exactly what we're doing this year part of that fundraising exactly right you can buy a ticket and toyota are a very generous sponsor for us and they've given us a vehicle at a very cheap price so we're selling tickets out there at the moment and hopefully we'll sell enough tickets to make another big chunk on top of that fundraising of course all this money goes to macquarie homestay because it is a rotary club of Devo south organised event, you're not paying anyone to do all this organisation, you're not paying to run the event, there are certain expenses involved with it, obviously we have to buy food to feed the riders as we ride around but pretty much you can be guaranteed that every single cent that's possible that, to go towards Macquarie Homestay, when you buy a ticket or when you uh, sponsor it, anything you do with it, you know that money's going back there. Macquarie Homestay is used across the entire region of course Lightning Ridge, Walgut, big users of Macquarie Homestay, Cobar is, of course Burke is, so there's a, a lot of places we'll be going to where Macquarie Homestay is a very important facility Wonderful facility I've used it myself on a number of occasions and uh, I don't look forward to it but uh, I know I'm going to have to in the future as well and it's being expanded uh, pretty much as we speak. Exactly right. And on the back of fundraising events like the Toyota Tour de Rock, the Country Women's Association have donated some money to it. They've been able to get grant funds over the years. Lots of little sponsors have gone into contributing to getting that to be able to keep building those stages because at the moment they're typically booked out almost all the time. So there is definitely a need for expansion. And what's happening with the sister city relationship you have with China? Well, we've got a couple of sister city relationships that we've had in the past, student relationships. So we've had students from Dubbo go to visit our sister city in China called Wuzhang and our sister city in Japan called Minakamo. So that's been going on for decades and they've been very successful. Of course, a pandemic came along and that threw a bit of a spanner into the works. But last year we started to make some moves to get some things happening again and we did our first student exchange in both directions with Minakamo last year and then this year we want to get back up and going with Minakamo again and with Wuzheng. But because we involve the Department of Education, obviously with the school visit there, there's a new rule that requires any, in, any international student visits on a site of any New South Wales school there must be an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, between the school and the uh, MOU has to be approved 
by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, DFAT. So we got permission last year to run our student exchange with Minicamo. This year we're working through that MOU. But we've got a minor concern that due to the current diplomatic relationship between China and Australia being a little bit frosty, they might deem students going to China as unsafe and we may not be able to do it. So we're working through it at the moment. We've had no final decision yet on this process, but we're working through that MOU process right now as we speak. And hopefully we'll be able to have those student exchanges going again to both China and Japan. So it's a a different international landscape. And you think about some of the things that happen when prime ministers meet or commentary on international media, you don't really realise it's going to affect students from Dubbo and students in Wujing not being able to go and visit each other. Yes, and if you want to defrost any relationship, a good idea is to have a relationship. (laughs) That's right. Now, some medical events have been held in the Dubbo area. We had two events last week, actually, a bit of a coincidence, they were both in the same week, but the University of Sydney School of Rural Health has the four-year medical program held here in Dubbo, and we want to make sure those students feel welcome, feel part of the community, and obviously at the end of their medical degree, we want them to stay in Dubbo or the region. So we held a welcome event for the year one students, 24 year one students came along to that. The year two and three students came along as well because it was a a function, a a night to basically celebrate the fact that we've got these students here. And it was a great chance to talk to those students. And I'd love to learn about how they've arrived at Dubbo, what has been their path to get here. Now, of course, the University of Sydney has their medical program now as a post-grad program. So all the students that are there have already got an undergrad degree in something. And I met a few of those and some of them brought along, some of them are married, some of them have got a partner, brought along their partner or their husband or wife. And one story I heard I absolutely loved in terms of the impact of this medical school to Dubbo. One person generated five people and a house sale in Dubbo because this particular person brought his wife along. His wife has got a, a specialty, specialty of her own, so she's now started a new business in Dubbo with that specialty. They've got an 11-month-old child, so that was going to be tough for them, for him to be studying, for his wife to be running a business, and so he brought along his parents as well. So now we've got five people that have moved to Dubbo on the back of that. He's actually His specialty that he's got in his undergrad degree is nuclear medicine, so he's working at the oncology department part-time at the hospital while he's studying medicine. So you've got all these sites benefits just out of these 24 students that have come along each year so that's fantastic so we're up to year one year two year three all here with the new medical program with 24 a year and the year four students are still from the old program that had 16 each year so that's all good news from that front and then we fast forward a few years after they've done their medical degree they've done their internship and they might want to become a GP a specialty as a GP then part of the program there is you become a GP registrar and spend time with GPs. Well, we've got 24 registrars in Dubbo and the region at the moment. So they were in Dubbo for an event as well to basically, again, talk about how wonderful Dubbo is, how wonderful the region is, how important these people are. They're only here for six months. So in that six months, we want to convince them that they want to be regional. And one of the gentlemen I spoke to on this particular night, again, it's where the light bulb goes on. He told me that he'd only been here for a few weeks so far, but he realised that where he was in Sydney, he was spending about 40 hours a month commuting to and back from work. And he got to a regional location and realised that the commute time was about five minutes. So suddenly he thinks, I've got a whole working week back every month if I live somewhere regional. He never thought about going regional before, but now he's thinking, well, this isn't such a bad option for me. So once they experience it, once they know how welcome they are, how much they're needed in regional areas, I think there's a chance to hold on to them. And good work by the Dubbo Area, Dubbo Regional Council for being involved in that and getting uh, doctors and medical uh, staff to stick in the area. And uh, you're right, it's not just Dubbo, you're you're looking after Western New South Wales. Yeah, many of these students that that spend time here, spend a bit of time in the region, and then as registrars, they might be in the region as well. So it's not just about Dubbo, it is about keeping doctors in the overall region. But even in Dubbo, obviously people from the region need to come to Dubbo for a lot of their specialty services. So making sure we've got those in Dubbo so people can find those services in Dubbo not have to go to Sydney. Okay, and uh, you've got a wonderful art exhibition in Dubbo. 
We have actually. The National Gallery of Australia has got its latest touring exhibition called Ceremony. It's the fourth Indigenous art triennial. Now this started way back in 2007, coincidentally when the Western Plains Cultural Centre was open, 10th of February 2007 that was open in Dubbo. But the good thing about this is that if you want to see this if this fourth Indigenous art triennial, if you want to see that anywhere in New South Wales, there's only one place to see it, and that's at Dubbo. That's at the Western Plains Cultural Centre. It's there for the next three months. It's a curated collection of works. There are 30 works in the overall collection. 18 of those are at the Western Plains Cultural Centre now. Obviously, they will all be at the National Gallery in Australia, at, at, in Canberra, at some point in time. It may have already been there. I'm not sure whether it's been there or going there, but they do tour it around as well. This is the fifth overall triennial that's been, and we've had four of those here in Dubbo. So pretty significant part of that, and we've got a great relationship with the National Gallery of Australia to make sure that when they have their touring exhibitions, they see Dubbo as a great place to go. And uh, wonderfully, it's got uh, some local artists that are involved as well. Well, one of the things that's interesting, when the person from the National Gallery came and spoke at the opening on Saturday, he said that this particular collection has had the most number of Radri artists in it uh, compared to any collection previously. So they're obviously taking more notice of the skill and the artistry of people from Radri land. Yeah. Well, there's a meeting in regards to the wind farm. The 19th of February, there's a public meeting being held in Molong. I can't make it on that particular night, unfortunately. But this is an interesting scenario, and this is what we're going to see more of going forward, Rod. We've got, for example, the Kerr's Creek Wind Farm, 63 wind turbines, and they're sitting around the Eucarina Kerr's Creek area. All of those wind turbines are in the Dubbo Regional Council area, but people that live in Kabon Council want to see what they can do about getting some of the money, some of the community benefit fund f- focused on Kabon area. Now, there's some people there that, that aren't happy about wind farms in general. Some people aren't happy about how much money that might be received by them. From my perspective, from a Dubbo Regional Council perspective, we will receive some money from the proponents of this. But my intention, as the Mayor of Dubbo Regional Council, is to spend that money in the Dubbo Regional Council area. I'm not intending on spending any of that money in Kabon Council. So some residents aren't happy about that. I've spoken to the Kabon Council Mayor, Kevin Beattie, about this, and, and I've made it quite clear what my intentions are, and he understands that fully. He said if he had money coming to Kabon Council, he wouldn't be thinking about spending it in Dubbo Regional Council area as well. But this is the problem when there is a boundary there, and unfortunately for people on the Kabon side, the boundary says that this activity is going to be in the Dubbo Regional Council area. It is tough for landowners as well. Some landowners, again, get to see the wind turbines, but they're not on their property, so they're not getting any of the benefit from those wind turbines. It is something that we've really got to manage carefully, and I suppose I'd be looking towards the state and federal governments here to make sure they manage this carefully, because wind farms, renewables in general, can be divisive. From my perspective, from a council perspective, we're not the consent authority. We don't get to say yes or no. What we can do is basically say, well, we accept the fact that it's happening. How can we benefit the residents in our region? And we can do that by making sure we get some of the money from these wind farms and spend it in the area and improve the amenity of the overall area. So it's a tricky one, but uh, I think the bottom line is, Rod, it's happening. How can we as the council make sure we gain benefits for our residents? All right. And uh, we're talking with Matthew Dixon, Mayor of Dubbo Regional Council. Candidates for the upcoming New South Wales uh, elections. Well, for the council election. So you've got the next council election is held on the 14th of September this year and various locations will start to run some candidate sessions. We've been in discussions with local government New South Wales, and which is the peak industry body for councils in the state, and we're organising, I haven't got any dates for you yet, but we're organising some sessions just for people that are interested in being a candidate, I would encourage as many people as possible, if you're interested in local government, if you're interested in seeing what happens in your community, then standing as a candidate is fantastic. And the more candidates we have, the better quality field we've got. Obviously, hopefully, the better councillors we get. So we'll have those sessions coming up. Uh, We'll let you know the exact dates, but it's something to start thinking about. I know it's only February, but September will be here before we know it, Rod. And uh, last week, it was announced that uh, councils that were forced to merge uh, there is now uh, an opportunity to demerge. Will uh, do you think Dubbo and Wellington be go- doing this? 
Well, two parts of this. I'll come back to the Dubbo Wellington question in a moment, Rod. The first part is, yes, there's been some discussion around Parliament putting some legislation in place to allow councils to demerge and a certain process to go through. The important part that I saw out of that particular discussion and that particular process was that the state government, in essence, is saying, sure, here is a path to demerge if you wish to do that, but you as the community will bear the entire cost of that process. And in my opinion, that means that there isn't an option to demerge because the expense to demerge is more than I think most councils would have available or even be able to justify. And it would probably be, I don't have an exact figure, but I can imagine it would be millions of dollars to demerge. And when you're looking at your community and saying, we've got a few million dollars spare here, we could spend it on potholes or spend it on demergers, what would you like us to do? So it makes it a tough argument to really put forward that demerger argument. In terms of Dubbo and Wellington, I certainly wasn't happy about the amalgamation, the forced amalgamation process way back in 2016. It happened in May 2016. I was Mayor of Dubbo City Council at the time. We fought against it. Wellington fought against it. The state government ignored us and did the amalgamation anyway. Eight years later, I'm certainly not thinking about demergers. I haven't really heard a lot of discussion from the community about demergers. Occasionally, someone will bring it up as a conversation, but I don't know that it's that serious. The only way that council would consider the demerge process would be if there was a strong movement from a large part of the community to say that this is what they really wanted. And then, of course, I think we'd be obliged to go down that path to look at demergers. But at the moment, there just doesn't seem to be that intent. It seems to be a case of what's happened. We weren't happy about it at the time, but it's done. Let's move on. Let's not cry over spilt milk and take advantage of that situation if we can. All right. And uh, finally, a young lad from Dubbo won an uh, Actor Award, uh, AACTA Award for Best Emerging Talent. Yes, of course. Congratulations to Nagali Shaw, who won the Brian Walsh Award at the Actors. And Nagali obviously grew up in Dubbo, went to school here in Dubbo, and is, I think, a, a great talent, obviously, and great to see discussions around Dubbo and some of the roles that Nagali's had so far. It brings to mind, I remember one time when the Home and Away actor Steve Peacock, who's obviously a Dubbo person as well, he was in Dubbo at one stage and I remember him talking at a session then and he did say that when you grow up in Dubbo, you have got unlimited potential for what you can do. So whether it be in the acting scene, whether it be in academia, sport, the great thing about Dubbo is you've got opportunity and you've got opportunity to do, to follow, to chase whatever dreams you want. And I think this is a great example with Nagali. And I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more about Nagali and from Nagali over the coming years. So uh, well done. Congratulations. And great to see Dubbo mentioned on the national stage, but yet again. Yes, so congratulations to Nagali Shaw uh, winning, winning the uh, Best Emerging Talent at uh, Award, sir. I thank you for your time today. Thank you, Rod. Meryl Memo with Matthew Dickerson from Dubbo Regional Council.